what? You came back. Why do you come back? Isn't it beautiful? I know, because it's a beautiful day. You could just wander out, self-soothe, down-regulate. Thanks for coming back for a little while. So, like, I always bring way too much information, so I'll PDF that first one because we didn't quite finish it. Then we talk about resiliency, then we talk about trauma-informed community. But invite me back. I'll fill you in. And, like, I know that amazing teachers are always like, enough of the overview, enough of the theory, Linda. Like, whatever. Uh, now, give us strategies. Teachers have taught us well over the years. They're like, just tell me what to do. As long as you know why we're asking you to do what they're, you're doing. So are you okay? Did you have a good lunch? You all right? Yeah, anybody who's triggered, just hit up the few little counselors in the room. We'll do the best we can. Right? Like we say, we're here all night. So that idea, are you okay if we move to a few things that we can do? And then we have like the classroom strategies the secondary one, oh my gosh, my girls have worked so hard on compiling everything, and we're just about there. So I'll send it to Meredith to send out, but we just need one little more round. Because secondary, as everyone knows, if we can do this work at the elementary level, secondary is okay. Because secondary is up against it. If kids can't regulate by the time they show up there, we are in a world of hurt, right? Because what do kids do when they can't regulate affect? They will find a way to regulate affect. So what do you do if you're up here all the time as a teen? Chances are you'll drink or you'll smoke dope because it will bring you down. If you're a kid who's highly dissociative, chances are you'll take a stimulant, right, meth or cocaine, to come up. And that's what you keep doing because you cannot regulate on your own. And then it taps into, oh yeah, get me going on the big level. Like all these things around FASD, what do you think is at the root of FASD? The fact that mothers have been traumatized. And at some point in their life, they used alcohol to try to regulate. Right? Look at the fentanyl crisis. Oh my goodness. People are like, what are the strategies for that? Why don't you look at the source of that? Right? When people are hurting, they will be prescribed opiates. When you become tolerant to the opioids, you will go to the next level. I mean, none of this is a mystery, and we stigmatize people for coping the only way they know how at this point in time. Oh my gosh, I got a little carried away on these things, right? But it's all linked to that. So up in Prince George, you know, the RCMP are like, I think we're losing the war on drugs, Linda. Yeah. So let's start a new war. I'm going to win that war on drugs if I can win the war on trauma. Because what if you had your kids who were feeling pretty good about themselves and could regulate affect? They're not going to use substances like they are now. Because you don't tend to use them when you're feeling good. Hey, do you want to see my two little favorite diagrams that I got out of my master's program at UVic? Because as an old girl, when you go back to school, sometimes master's programs are not mm, really useful. Just said. I know. So uh, can I draw you one on the board? Are you all right with that? So this is what we do all the time. Like kids. Oh, let's see if it shows up a little bit better. So it's like that infinity loop. Like kids with trauma, kids with adverse event. They've got the trauma effects over here, whatever that level is. And then they put in place their coping. And in all systems, what we do is we take this child, youth, or adult, and we take away all their coping, 
and don't put anything back. Whatever you take away from that kid, you've got to replace it. Otherwise, their distress goes right up. Those two sides have to balance. So what happens with a lot of your older kids, if we get them off substances, chances are they'll go into gaming, right? Heavy duty. It's a coping. Sometimes exercise, heavy duty. It's a coping, right? Whatever it is, it's just coping. So we have to do a better job of figuring out if you're asking him not to do what he's doing right now, then give him something to do. Like, replace it. Because if you don't do replacement coping, this isn't going to work. So that idea, because of this piece, they have actually physical distress that they can't really connect to what happened to them. But they also internalize, I wasn't worthy of protection. I wasn't worthy of a lot, so I deserve all this stuff that's happened to me. And that shifting that message for us in counseling and in education is the hardest one to shift. And teachers have the potential, because if kids are successful at anything, and I mean anything, that's what shifts it. Right? But the idea of what happens, which is why our alternate schools are so important, because a lot of our high-end ACEs kids will get booted out of every regular school there is, it's the last stand. And if we can keep them in the education system, we'll keep them out of all the other systems, like big time. So you're okay if we kind of stay with that definition, right? So it doesn't matter what the event is. Sometimes it's little events, sometimes it's big events, and everything they do revolves around what happened to them. And it's all just coping. Whether you're a perfectionist or a workaholic, it's coping. Whether you use substances, it's coping. That's all it is. But we stigmatize a lot of people, usually because of the legality. But wouldn't this be beautiful? if we didn't have to talk about, wow, you have an ACEs informed school, like Quinnell is rocking it, right? What if it was like, wow, Quinnell uses best practice. So we're not gonna say anymore, are you a trauma informed school? Like, cause some parents, cause parents don't know this information. They're like, if that school is a trauma informed school, that might be catching. I'm not going to send my kids to a trauma-informed school. But if it's best practice, which is what it is, right? And one day, we're not going to be out here talking trauma-informed. We're just going to say best practice. Wouldn't that be lovely? So we're trying really hard. It's not about processing what happened to that child, youth, or adult. It's focusing on what can they do right now. And how are we going to build and tap into their amazing resiliency. Because don't you love your ACEs kids? I mean, on a rough day, they're hard to love. I know that, right? Alternate high schools know that. But don't you love their level of resiliency? They have been battered and bruised and beat up, and they show up. And we talked in Quinnell, like frontline staff is so important because you know, we honor those kids who actually are able to show up. And sometimes I don't know how they show up. And if you have someone at the front desk who's a little bit uh, not trauma-informed, a little grouchy, they show up. And the wonderful admin person says, you're late. <laughs> like, whoa, let's like, be a little more compassionate, a little more welcoming. So the basic presentation is that brain is wired for high end. And what do you see at high school people with your kids? When things are kind of peaceful for a while and there's no conflict, they will create drama because that feels normal. And what happens in elementary when you have, like, Mind Up is the sweetest little program, right? Aw, teaching kids to be mindful. 
If you have hyper-aroused kids, they can't do it. Like, to try to get a hyper-aroused kid into a relaxed state, it's actually unsafe for them. So when you're trying to do mind up and you got those little guys that are just fired up and they're kind of wrecking everything and acting out, one of my amazing teachers in Prince George, he said, I figured that out, that mind up doesn't work for all ACEs kids, because it, it does not. None of it works for all ACEs kids. So he took a, a roll of masking tape and he tapes off. When they're doing mind up, he tapes off at the side of their desk a little square. And he says, while well, the rest of us are doing ah, breathing, mindful practice, you get to do whatever you need to go do within your square. And they jump up and down and stand on their head and wiggle around, and he met all their needs, right? And that's the problem with a lot of the programs, and I know you're program inundated. Because trauma, ACEs informed is a big umbrella, like growth mindset, all the zones, all these different mind up fall under it. But not one program works for all ACEs kids. And the best thing we learned like decades ago is who's in front of you. What's this kid need, right? And how can I incorporate it into the classroom? So they keep behaving under what we call normal circumstances as if they're being threatened, as if they're being abandoned, as if they're being abused, because that's what their brain tells them. So they can't stop, right? And finding out what works for them and what do your hyper-aroused kids need to do more than anything? Move, move. The worst thing we do for ACEs, hyper-aroused kids, is ask them to sit. Because they really can't do it, right? You gotta move, you gotta move, you gotta move. And the little wiggle wobble stools and the stationary bikes, aw, we got little schools in Prince George at the back of the class, bless those teachers, right? They got a couple little guys on the bikes and another guy on his individual little trampoline and they're just going like mad while the teacher is teaching. And they can hear you, right? They're moving, but they can hear you. And I thought it was so cool as a way to generate more money for a school counselor in every school. I thought, why don't we get rid of all deaths, put all children on stationary bikes, hook them up to the power grid, and the money we save at BC Hydro, we can pay for school counselors. Wouldn't that be cool? Ever teachers, get rid of your desk, get a bike, you teach at the front. You don't have to buy those pesky little gym memberships. You just pedal all day. Better for you, right? So if these are the areas that we're looking at, chances are each of these areas might need a little bit of a different focus, right? And you can't do it all at a classroom level. But an ACE is informed was never meant to be an excuse for high-end behavior. It's an understanding of why they do what they do, right? And then we're gonna figure out, if this is why he's doing that, what can I put in place? Like the masking tape on the floor for the hyper-aroused kid, right? To get his needs met. And, and for a lot of kids at a high school level, Sometimes we ask them, what do you think is the area we should work on here, right? And sometimes it won't be attendance, it'll be relationship. So if we have a school counselor, that's what we're gonna focus on. And if we don't, we just try to keep them attuned to us. Because what we see more than anything else is fear. And sometimes the best defense is a great offense. So they're coming at you, but it's fear, right? Because I worked with an amazing principal and, and she shared this story. She had a high-end, hyper-aroused little guy and they were like, what are we gonna do with this kid? And she had him in the office after school one day and she slowed down and said, it must be so hard to live in that head. 
and he burst into tears, right? Because somebody understood that that's exactly what was going on. It's trying to live in that head. So I'm going to give you a trauma model to work with. Woohoo! And so all everything you write about now, you can say, okay, this is what we're doing in our class. Just so you all know, we're working in phase one and phase three of a classic trauma model. We're working on safety and stabilization and reintegration and reconnection. Write that up in your notes, right? And nobody will give you a hard time because they're totally baffled, right? And also say, and we're dealing with darn that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Just write that up. In your IEP, write that up. I think we're just dealing with stress hormones. So classic model, safety and stabilization, that's trauma-informed. What do you do in your school, in your classroom, to try to get to a place where kids feel safe? And it's going to be felt, not taught, right? And how do you, phase three is like, get kids good at something. Phase two is for counselors, right? And that's why if we have a school counselor, that's the area they can work on. But phase one and phase three, anybody can do that once you understand why you're doing it. And you do such amazing work when you can meet these requirements. Get them to feel safe, get someone to attune to them, and teach them something they can be competent at. It's like one, two, three. And it's huge work, right? It's huge work. But I know, like we've seen it work all the time. And the idea that we said earlier, like either shy or they're going to be the ones up front and they're going to be like the bullies. I'm going to take them on. And the little ones tend to play it out sometimes. They'll keep acting out in front of you what's happened in their world with other kids. Like they play it out. And a lot of our kids, young and in high school, they are so sleep deprived. These are tired kids. Because not only, like sometimes within their environment, there is no safe place to sleep, but also like they're scared of the dreams they have. And if they've been medicated, pharmaceutical blunting, at a high school level, then the idea of one of the worst side effects is the dreams. So they don't sleep. So this is huge for learning, right? And in Dawson Creek, we have your lovely person up there who's looking at sleep disturbances. Bless his heart, right? And what they can do in that area. And hyperarousal, so much irritability. Like, they just feel awful. Like, it'd be like you're angry all day long. Like, isn't that a beautiful state? Hey, let's do math when you're really angry. That's always been known to really work, right? And how do you define safety? Like, what is safety? Like, wouldn't it be great? I bring a bear because I'm from the north. But I understand you have more issues with bears down here than we do up there. Something about habitat. But it'd be awesome if our kids only had to worry about the odd bear and the apple tree. Wouldn't that be lovely? But it's bigger than that. So if we have ministry help and if we can resolve the outside threat, awesome. But this inside threat, how they feel, that's what's tough. Right? And that's when we talk about they're not going to give up that coping until they feel safe. And they'll keep throwing chairs, and they'll keep spitting, and they'll keep running until someone attunes. Because that's how it works. And the idea of you kind of have to show them that you do sort of like them, or at least accept them. You know, smiling at people goes a long way. You ever notice that with kids? But your teenagers will sometimes, high-end naces kids will be like, why are you being nice to me? Like, I don't trust this. What do you want? And it takes a while. 
And how stable are you on a good day? I know we all have those off days. And do you always follow up on what you promised you would do? Because trust is huge. And if you can't do something, tell them, right? And find someone else and make it transparent. Everything that's going on, like a lot of your ACEs kids know that you're talking about them, right? And your older kids are like, so what do you guys say about me? Like, what are you writing about me? Like, what is this IEP stuff, right? So you make it clear because so much is being hidden from them and they know it. And how are you doing with your own counter-transference? You know, transference is when kids put on you stuff that isn't you. It's like you represent an adult. You are in for it today because you happen to be an adult. It doesn't really matter that it's you. It doesn't matter that it's you. And counter-transference is when you put back on kids stuff that really isn't them. It's like, wait a minute, why does this kid bug me so much? Oh my gosh, he's just like my brother and I didn't like him either. <laughs> what? It wasn't even the kid. It was like my stuff. It always happens. And trauma-informed is understand why they cope, how they're coping right now, and try not to re-traumatize them. And what do we know for hard work and stressed out teachers? The number one way you can start to re-traumatize a kid, raise your voice, right? Yell at a kid. Like it's the number one trigger for an ACEs kid, right? And a lot of times it's not a teacher yelling. They raise their voice this much and he went off. Right, because it takes them right back. So, because so many of your kids have witnessed and heard, like a lot of relational violence, emotional stuff, and like how else do you inadvertently re-traumatize your kid, your kids? You kind of put them out, right? You reject them, like that's what it feels like to them, and we have. We know we have like amazing teachers who are themselves ACEs survivors who get triggered by ACEs kids because nobody will trigger you faster. If you experienced adverse events as a kid, an ACEs kid will tap right into that and send you off. We understand we still have teachers who get physical with kids, right? And that has to end. And it's the hardest thing for what some of the teachers are experiencing, and usually at a high school level. And darn that attachment. If you don't have attachment, this is going to be tough, right? Because it does, we understand if you have ACEs and you find someone in your world who you attach to, that can mitigate everything. That is so cool. But attachment usually has a biological piece. So I'm shooting for attunement. Can you get attuned to this kid? Somebody get attuned. Because look what it helps them sort out, right? And for people in this room that had a healthy attachment, did you, do you remember like when you first learned the emotions you know? Aw, is when you're so little. Right? And then maybe you built on it. But it starts so young. And your kids coming in as ACEs kids, they need time to catch up. Like they've been five years without it, and they came into our system. Give me five years. I'll get them there. Like we can all get them there, but give me time. Because it's attunement and that subtle adjustment. When you got to, you know, all of us have worked with those hyper aroused guys, and like as a school counselor, like we will them to come down a notch. I need you to come down to my level of regulation. And you can feel it. And once in a while, you're not just attuned, you actually like the kid. Aww. And even though teachers are not supposed to have favorites, we do. Right? There's always that kid. 
and you kind of carry a story for a long time. So the idea to regulate, for kids to regulate, saves their life. So without a co-regulator, you can't regulate. You can't get there without, are you going to stay with substances, or behavioral addictions, right? People in the room, you'll be happy to know that online shopping is now an official behavioral addiction. <laughs> what? I know. Social media is now an official addiction. Just saying, right? People that are having a hard time not having your phone on right now, that's the way kids are too. So if we can help them regulate in the school, but like we, we kind of, like Meredith and I were talking, we throw out the word social emotional learning. Yeah, do this. This is why you do it, right? This is why it has such a focus, because it will save their life, and it does. All right, are you going to like the next one or no? Oh, he likes that one. So how well regulated can you stay every day in the face of ACEs kids who are highly dysregulated? Right? It's hard, right? Especially because you have your own life and you're a human being. What? Even teachers are human beings. I had a kid ask that one time, are teachers real? <laughs> They're pretty real, all right. So for all these years, I've always struggled, like how well regulated do we have to stay with ACEs kids? <clears throat> and I shared it with Dan and Quinnell. My favorite client story, I took on a new guy on parole, and I always do this little assessment with them when we meet across the table. I'm like, so you feel okay? And this guy had like significant addiction, trauma, and a little bit of a brain injury, and he's in a world of trouble. And so I do this little thing, so are you going to be okay? You feel okay working with an old girl? And he's like, yeah. You're like someone who's been smoking dope for 20 years. <laughs> Aw, thank you. That is so sweet of you to notice, right? That is so dear. So. That's what I keep in mind now. We have to be like as chill as someone who's been smoking dope for 20 years. You go into that parent-teacher meeting, and you know you got an ACEs parent coming in right there. So the girls, we were looking for resources, and they found this one, and it, it was like put on your cap every day. Like how calm can you stay in the face of what's coming at you? How attuned are you? Because attunement is about being proactive like, and work in that room. So you're one step ahead of your kids that are starting to go off. Because when they're in a full trigger, it's really hard to get them down. But if we can step in before they're, when they're just in a limbic state instead of a reptilian brain, then we can be there. So it's like kind of checking in. And with your dissociative kids, Sometimes they just need a gentle word or two. Like they, sometimes they panic with too much closeness. You can actually get closer to your hyper arouse. But dissociative kids, big wall, right? And that's slow work, like very gentle. And being present and being predictable. And so often if you're a teacher, an ACEs teacher who's a little bit dissociative, this is hard for you and they picked that up, right? And we thought they were doing okay until they got to don't, right? That got pretty bossy. But like, we always say, you know, don't let their emotions escalate yours. But sometimes it works. One of my guys up north, like he used to have big blowouts and he'd storm out of the school, ripping the door off the hinge, trying to, and he'd be going down the road and I'd be following him and he'd be like, why are you following me? And I yell right back at him. See, I said don't do that, didn't I? <clears throat> I yell back at him and say, because it matters. It matters to me what's happening to you. And then he always would turn around and he'd say, there's no need to raise your voice. <laughs> don't raise your voice, Linda. Okay. And helping parents at elementary if they still are coming to understand that they're ACEs kids. 
So lots of times your parents can't regulate, and the ones we have to watch are the parents that dissociate at a high level. Because they come in to meet with you, and you give them like maybe not the best news about their kid. Well, you guys do it so beautifully. Sam seems to have high energy, <laughs> and seems to be interested in almost everything, except, right? You do a beautiful job of wording it. As soon as they hear that their kid isn't doing well, they check out. So then schools tend to label them as non-compliant parents, even though they just are trying to be OK. right? And they're dissociating at a high level. And the idea, and we do this with all service providers, the hardest thing about trauma is you can't fix it, like because you cannot go back in time. If you could go back in time, then we'd have it. So you can't fix it. You have to figure out how can you lower distress? How can you lower pain for these kids and fear and focus on what they can do, right? We're building on that because you can't fix this. But trauma is not a destiny, but if all systems don't work in this area, it is, right? And all you have to do in Vancouver is go to certain areas, and that's trauma as a destiny. So it's figuring out a way to get on top of it. And let's talk brain stuff. Like, how can that developing neocortex, how does it help keep them in that zone so this limbic brain, reptilian brain, doesn't take over. So a co-regulator does that, right? By stepping in, stepping in. What do you need? I notice you're starting to get a little bit, you know, up there. And yesterday, I'm going to predict, yesterday when I asked you to make the switch from this activity you love to one you really don't like, you threw the chair, crashed around, did this. So I'm wondering today, because I'm going to predict that might happen again, because prediction is hard when you can't get to the left side, right? I'm going to predict, so what could we do that might change that today? Like, how can I help you today? And predict what's going to be up. So it's also that idea of when their resources fail, somebody step in. We keep punishing kids because their resources fail. Instead of, I need a co-regulator right now. Wouldn't it be great if you could get kids to say that? Hi, I'm starting to get triggered. I need a co-regulator right now. That'd be beautiful. That language would be awesome. So interventions, right? Quinnell uses the ARC. Other schools using the ARC. Have you got other? Right? Because it's such a clean way of looking at strategies and interventions. It's like attachment, which I call attunement. I don't know what you guys see it as too, right? Yeah, that goes along there. Affect regulation, so under the R, and C, competency. So we've gotten all out of touch with how ACEs kids work. These are their three main areas. And sometimes affect regulation, sometimes it'll work with a program, but not always. Like the zones is the coolest little program for kids that know emotion. But you put an ACEs kid in a zones program, and they're like, hey, I'm in the green. Right? I'm like, you know green is not an emotion? You got that, don't you? And they don't know what that means. But they know you like it, right? So they go out there and that, no, for sure, Mrs. Smith, I'm in the green. You're not in the green. You're so far out of the green, we're in like chartreuse, right? <laughs> we're way out of there. So it's that idea, right, of figuring out. Because the zones, you've got to back right up with ACEs kids and start teaching basic emotion. Otherwise, they're going to run it at a very superficial level. That's how they take it in, right? So, and competency, oh my gosh, any activity, anything that they're good at, and that's what we're going to focus on. 
because it's amazing for them to be good at something. Because what at a, and you see it down here, you see it in Prince George, at a high school level, who, what is the, the group that does the best job of pulling on competency from ACE's youth? Gangs. The gangs know how to play on this better than anybody. And if we could just get other organizations to do a better job like they do. Because what do they say? to your ACEs kids, right? <clears throat> hey, you're one of us, right? And you're really good at this. And now you have a family around you, support. And they were like this. So it's kind of sad, right? So where to start? First of all, help them with regulation, affect regulation. Show them how to be with other kids and help them with competence and work on that problematic auto-regulation if it comes up, like the head bang and the like repetitive stuff <coughs> that goes on. But the idea of most of the stuff we work on is like based on can they even self-reflect? And this classic one is, you need, we need to work on your problem-solving skills. That's in the left. How can I get there if I'm running on the right? I got to feel safer. You got to give me time. You got to give me some co-regulation so I can get to the left. And then I might start developing problem-solving skills. Wouldn't that be cool? But we assume they have them. We assume that. And like, what's their processing style? And like, don't send them to a reflection room when they can't even self-reflect. I know, but we. We do the best we can, right? So like, how do you overcome habitual fight, flight, freeze? And it's gonna be about how you feel, they feel around you and in that classroom. So doesn't this link into teacher support? So that teachers feel more support, right? And that they can feel good about being there and not as stressed out as they are feeling right now. When we do this full up, because I do this stuff with all kinds of groups and people, when we do the full up, like we'll do it over three days. We have a whole half day on secondary trauma, intergenerational historical effects, like strategies for adults, right? A whole morning on brain. There's so much behind this, like big time. So you just come up to Prince George, hang, hang out with me for three days, you will crawl home. <laughs> you will be like, oh my gosh, don't talk to me about trauma ever again, right? So the strategies, if they're hyper aroused, you're gonna do something to bring them down, right? But don't assume that, like we said with mind up, Taking a hyper-aroused kid to a relaxed state will actually sometimes trigger them because they have to be on all the time. So for them, it's better movement, activity, movement, redirect, redirect, right, than trying to stop it because the brain can't stop it just now. Like it's, and your dissociative kids, it's harder work to bring them into the world where they can engage a little bit, feel a little bit, it's baby steps for them because they are so shut down. And the neuroscience of emotion says most of the kids you have that are ACEs kids, the emotions they show are all about threat and self-protection. We're not even in the zone of positive feeling. Like the feel good is a threat because then they wait for the other shoe to drop. And then I'm vulnerable. If I feel good, that means something will happen and take this away. Because like, look at what happens to a lot of people in this room. You're always waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? You don't have to nod your head, just blink once. I'll see it, <laughs> <clears throat> right? But like soothing, caring behavior, a lot of our ACEs kids, they're just not there. That's not the emotions they know. But some ACEs kids do go there, like, but over anything else, and they want to take care of you. 
So if they have an opportunity, they'll try to be a caregiver, right? So if you're having a rough day, and especially adolescents, they always pick that up. Hey, Mrs. Smith had a trouble with your significant other on the weekend. <laughs> they always pick it up, <clears throat> right? Having trouble with your own kids? Hmm. Yeah. So they step in because they've been caregivers at home. And anything can be a trigger. Anything can set a kid off. But what do we do in most of our schools? Inner city schools, we have food all the time. Feed them. Internal triggers are huge, right? For a lot of our kids, schools are so torn on this because like we said, they are so tired. Like, do you let them sleep, right? Because up north, we let them sleep because we weren't, nothing was going to happen until we did because they're exhausted. And the idea, because don't you want to be creative sometimes? Don't you want to be spontaneous? And for those kids, it doesn't work. It's like everything the same, everything consistent. And when you bring in new things, you do it slow. And I think Meredith and I were talking, you know, like we're the stretching, where teachers like are taught, like stretch them a bit. But for ACEs kids, they can't stretch it until they feel safe, which is what zone, Meredith, what would you call it, safety? Comfort zone. So the comfort zone, which we would call safety and trauma-informed. And give them that sense of trust, right? Because a lot of what's happened for them, which is why they're staying over here, is because nothing is predictable and it's chaotic, like hugely chaotic. And for youth, high school kids, because we're trying to talk both, they really need staff to be consistent. Like they will throw them so fast that they notice any kind of change. So tell them up front. Give them fair notice. Like tell them what's going to shift or change because they can't predict. Not yet. We'll get there. And be honest with kids. Oh my goodness, like what is happening? Right, not hiding information as best we can. Make them a part of a discussion to the best of your ability based on developmentally where they're at, right? Because they, a lot of these kids, communication hasn't been really strong within their environment. So we help them get there. That's where it goes. And oh my gosh, give them choice. Like we do, we talk it all the time. Would you like to do this or this, right? Rather than this is what you're doing because it replicates what's already happened. This is what you're doing and you have no choice. And it's hard because some people are like, oh, what? I don't think I want to give him more power. You're not giving him more power. You're replacing what was taken away, right? And, and he'll fight for it until you do because he's going to fight in safe places with safe people. And we always acknowledge when they're triggered, it's always something bigger than we think it is. Because the brain says, you're in trouble. This is a threat. And the idea of, you know, like I know classrooms, like because we're trying to stay in front of this so you don't see kids triggered to that place where they lose all control, because it's horrible for them. I know it's hard on all you, but it's terrible for an ACEs kid to lose control. And a lot of times they won't remember it when it's done. And can you remove the trigger? Usually it's another kid, so it's a little tricky, right? <laughs> it makes it hard, but always taking steps because they feel so much shame. They are humiliated when they lose control. They feel awful and to try to monitor that, but you need support too when it goes this, this high. And for youth, you give them, you always give them space. Like I know that sometimes safety-wise you have to have people step in, but you give them space. And find the person they connect to. Like we do this crazy thing when kids are escalated, everybody comes at them. 
Like they corner them and they come at them. It's like, whoa, slow it down and back up just a little bit because it's a threat. And if they'll take food, give them food, right? It's huge for them, a blanket, anything to help them ground and somebody understand what this was all about because it's terrible when they go into this full thing. And debriefing with the poor staff, right? And if you have a school counselor, get one in to talk to this youth, because it's high end. And this is crazy for us, because every time you put a boundary in place, chances are they fight. Because in their environment, there hasn't been a lot of structure sometimes and no boundaries. So it's seen as this novel thing and it's a threat. So we're always predicting like new rules of engagement. Hey, little buddy, <clears throat> I know we haven't done this before, but there's a new rule. And the last time we had a rule in the classroom, like you kind of told us we were old cows and then you threw the chair and then you dumped, you tried to take the goldfish out of the tank, right? And I'm wondering if we try this, and I'm going to tell you why it's here, how can we help you this time? Because they will fight against any kind of limit. And the idea of right, how you do the talk in front of it, how you be preventative and proactive, like co-regulator, one step ahead, like just letting them know. And they have difficulty because a lot of what's happened to them is around limits. Someone has been erratic in terms of here's what's happened today, here's your punishment today. And sometimes in schools we don't mean to, but we actually replicate with that pattern of punishment. And this is the hardest thing, like we said, for those 10 categories to become a fully trauma-informed school, discipline is gonna be the one that needs the most conversation from everyone. Because nobody's got all the answers at this point. And what does a consequence look like that makes sense for what happened? And if it's a triggered response, then you need someone in there to help them understand what a triggered response is so that we can start taking back control. Because where do you start with kids? It's like, wow, it's not, why did you hit Jim? What happened before you hit Jim? That's what we need to work on. So what happened like when he got close to you? What happened at a body-based level? Where did you feel it? Because most of the time, people in here that might have a short fuse, just saying, some people do, before you blow up, chances are you feel it somewhere physically, right? Like kids, you watch your youth, their jaw tenses, their fist will clench, right? They stiffen, and they feel it in their body. So we work with them to identify that, and then we're proactive and preventative because that's something they can work with. And when they get upset, right, it's usually the idea of internal stuff that's going on. There was a beautiful article written a couple years ago about foster adopted parents, and they use the term black holes. So they adopted or fostered ACEs kids, and all of a sudden everything's going well, you're doing, you're being consistent, predictable, safe, and their behavior tanks and they actually go into a time hole, a time warp, and they're back in the old stuff, and they behave accordingly. And it had nothing to do with what was going on right now. So what do you think so far? Is it kind of your school's world sometimes? Wouldn't it be cool if one day I asked that and people are like, absolutely not. <laughs> like, we've never seen that before, Linda. <laughs> what are you talking about? Our children can all regulate, right? And they have so much empathy for everyone. So that idea is some in elementary, they're really looking at time in versus time out. Hey, little buddy, it's our special time together. I see you're starting to dysregulate, so we're just gonna have a little moment, right, right together, instead of whoosh, I'm shipping you out. Sometimes they need a quieter space, right? But other times they need 
a little redirection. And accommodating always, because we do this thing with ACEs kids, because sometimes it's so hidden, is that we assume that they kind of are close to their chronological age, and they are so not, right? We're down here, and in high school, we see this over and over. We have a 17-year-old who's having a tantrum. Like, he's, emotionally, he's a two- and three-year-old in this moment. So how would you intervene with a two and three year old with respect for the fact that he's 17, right? Chances are redirect, redirect, bring him in a little bit closer, right? Because he's two and he's three in that moment and that's tough, right? I work with the big guys on parole and they get triggered all the time and it's like, oh my gosh. How do we work with someone in a big body who's two and three right now? So what does that look like? A lot of the strategies are about transitions because they struggle with those so much. And they say, you know, for a lot of times, like don't have a person say it's time to end the activity you love so much and are now going to the one that you don't like. You just play music because the only thing that's going to get beat up is the music player, right? And they won't connect it with you as a human being that's suddenly doing bad things. Wouldn't it be lovely if our schools had quiet areas? Oh, especially high school. Wouldn't that be lovely? Like a down-regulating room, a peaceful room where kids that need to downregulate and you teach them what that looks like can go there and use it. And like we were working with some of the schools in Prince George and they're so dear, like some of the teachers said, never mind the kids. Like, could I just have a downregulation room? <laughs> like once I get there, then we're all good. And then there's companies that are now making like beautiful, like little wood calm boxes for classrooms, because we know you have no space in your schools. And they have little bubble windows, and they're beautiful. And the teacher said, do they make those in adult sizes? Because I would like one in my classroom. I'll crawl in and let the kids just do whatever. And because kids need a space where the talking stops and helping them with basic regulation. And you gotta match the intervention with the energy shown, right? We do this crazy thing. For hyper-aroused kids, it's like, he's way up here, and we're like, you need to sit in that chair and not move. Really? It's like when you had younger kids and people that foster and adopt. Ever done that where you're like, you need to go to your room, right? And they tear the room apart. So a lot of amazing teachers are doing this thing now. We're going for a run, right? You and the whole group, we're going for a run in the morning and we're going for a run in the afternoon. And we are moving it. We're trying to match your energy to the best of our ability. Because, and people know the incredible five-point scale, it works for ACEs kids as well. A lot of the strategies that work for autism work for ACEs kids, because it's sensory, right? Weighted vests, weighted blankets, right? Like they need that. They need to feel. So we use that one. Basic regulation, any kind of break, right? Like, that's why we redirect. When you see that high-end affect showing up, it's like redirect, redirect. I was like, the piece I used to do up north, and I used to collect bugs out of windows and off the grills of trucks. I know, it's one of my favorite trauma interventions for little ones. And you go into the classroom, and you got this kid, he's going off the walls, and I'd always, and I'd go get one of my favorite dead bugs, right? And he'd be starting to go, and I'd be like, Sam, come over here. you got to see this. Whoosh, right? And you shift him right over. If you don't like bugs, I don't know what you're going to use. But <laughs> find something that they really like. Right? And healing. For a lot of ACEs kids, they don't play. 
Right? Coming to school is like, even though they're not acting like it is, is having the library and the fact that you have sand tray and water play. Like, they love that because they've never had an opportunity to play. And free play at elementary is so important for ACEs kids. More important than almost anything else. And any kind of like specific regulation, we understand like any kind of drumming or music. So there's a rhythm, there's a beat, right? And that helps you to kind of get control of what's happening here and putting that in. And any kind, like the faces, the emoticons, whatever it is, and they got great ones. There's cute ones out here for the faces. And my favorite story of resiliency and specific regulation, I work with an amazing survivor in Prince George. And in grade four, grade four, she knew she didn't have the ability to really express herself and to read other people's emotions. So a counselor gave her the emoticons and she took them home, cut them out, put them in a jar. And when she would go home at night, she'd dump them on the table and try to figure out what she felt that day and what others had showed her in terms of emotion. Pretty cool, eh? That's like resiliency. Empowerment. Because like a lot of little guys, we had a little guy up north that showed up and he was like five or six. I can't remember if he was five or six. And he walked in the building and he said, who's the boss here? <laughs> so he knew from day one, show me the seat of all power because we're going at it for the next 12 years. <laughs> and he declared it, right? Because it's like empowering in a safe place to give you back some of the things that were taken away from you. It's so powerful, and probably people in here have done that all the time. When you have a little guy that's really seeking power, give him a little bit of power. Like you don't want to give him keys to the whole school, but a little bit. Hey, before we had to go, let's talk grounding. How, how do you do every day to ground? What's your favorite grounding? And for people, like even, I don't know, 10 years ago, if you Googled grounding, they'd be like, so you dig the trench three feet deep and lay the conduit in the gravel. Not that kind of grounding. How do you help kids stay here? Because if we can keep them present with you in the classroom, woohoo! it's way better. It gives them back control. Five, four, three, two, one is like old grounding, like classic grounding, but it's kind of a high number. So I back it off, like you name me two things, name me one thing, right? Just to try to keep them in the room. And especially this is really for your dissociative kids, your super dissociative kids. And, and a lot of this, like we can send you all kinds of grounding. Mental grounding for a lot of kids, like it's like they don't even know what day it is. <clears throat> they are so dissociative. They don't know the day, the month. So teachers do that beautiful thing where they, you know, you have it on your board, your little calendar. But like mental grounding, they can also have them come up with three things or two things that they love. So they memorize it because grounding has to be worked on. This is why if you have a school counselor or a child and youth care worker, this really helps. But they do. They come up with a list of their favorite things and they go over it in their head over and over. So when you walk by, you can say, oh, wonder about those, wonder about those hockey teams. Wonder about, and that's their cue, like just say those words in your head to get you back, to bring you back. And it's huge. Any kind of tactile. And Prince George teachers have baskets of grounding material at their desk. So a little, and not things that are heavy and sharp. Like not, you know, because we always did this thing for years. Oh yeah, give everyone a rock. Don't give them a rock, <laughs> right? There's been a lot of property damage with the rocks. But it's like having a basket of stuff, like the little squishy stuff, dollar store stuff, right? Bark, 
like dried plants, whatever it is that kids love to smell, to hold, because it helps them stay present for you. And small groundings, whether it's like little tiny worry stones that don't have weight, right? Velvet, anything that smells good. And when we go to dissociative kids, you've got to get them up. So like for elementary, I spy is the best thing ever invented for dissociative kids because it brings them back into the room. And for a lot of kids who can't be touched, right, you teach them like to hug themselves, little butterfly hugs, right? And it's comforting for them, like if that's a strategy. Like feather tracing, some of your kids are so dissociative, they don't know where their body stops or ends or begins or however you want to frame it. So they just trace it. And they can sit at their desk sometimes and sometimes if they have something you can tell, they're trying to figure out like, where am I here? Where am I? Because dissociation can be at the highest level. And relaxation, you have to be careful with ACEs kids. Because if you put a hyper-aroused kid into a relaxed state, they lose a sense of time, they, they don't know what happened. So we just do like little baby relaxation, like squeeze a lemon, let it go. So you're just feeling that let go. And I should share one of my favorite groundings I used to use up north is called reorientation grounding. And I used to use my mom on the phone. So I get these hyper-aroused kids, and they're going off the rails, and these are the big guys. And I'd phone her. I'd say, Lori, I need you to talk to Sam. And so Sam would be raging up and down. He's tearing apart the school. And I'd be like, hey, Sam, phone call. <laughs> I was like, what the heck? Nobody would phone me. No, there's a phone call here for you. And my mom would be on the other end of the phone. And she had a beautiful voice, and she was well-trained. I said, don't ask him what he did, and don't ask him what's happening. Just talk. And then she'd be like, hi, Sam, it's Lori. I'm looking out on my deck, and there's little birds, and the sun is shining. <laughs> <laughs> and this kid is like, what the? <clears throat> and you get him right back. And this is beautiful, because I used her for years. And I presented that like years ago to some teachers and I ran into them this fall and two of them started using their moms. <laughs> they put their mom on the phone every time they got this little dysregulated kid. Hey, talk to Sam. Beautiful. So someone in here close to retirement, do that for a business. <laughs> Have down-regulating voice, do phone. All teachers can make this little phone call. It would be beautiful, right? Because it brings them right down. And it's nobody involved in their world. It's this, like, this beautiful voice. So there you go. You got to think outside the box.